You all kind of acted like you had hearing loss there for a minute. <laughs> I mean, it's the truth, isn't it? We correct our children for the same things that we do in our relationship with God. We tell them, stop complaining. And God's saying, set an example. <laughs> So last night we talked about having realistic expectations and that was our first go at trying to help us get content, how to put our expectations in God and not in people and the world and things and so on and so forth. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.6 6, that godliness accompanied with contentment is great and abundant gain. So what I get out of that is that a godly person who's content <laughs> It's just like in the very best place that you can possibly be. And see, really, joy doesn't come from our circumstances all lining up. It comes from what's in our heart because the world is full of people who have what you think you want, and they're not happy either. I think we better say that again. Some of the most unhappy people in the world are the people who have it all. So it's not about fame, it's not about your name being well known, it's not about how much money you have or your position at work or your social circle, your level of education, what side of the tracks you were born on, it's none of that. It's hard attitude. Hard attitude. There's nobody that's more thankful than a truly, I mean nobody that's more happy than a truly thankful person, a truly content person. The word content means satisfied to the point where you're not disturbed no matter what's going on. Satisfied to the point where you're not disturbed. Not satisfied to the point where you never want any change. We all want to see things get better. But satisfied to the point where where you're at right this minute, you're not disturbed about it because you believe that God is working and that things are changing and you will see the result of it in due time. Let's look at Philippians 4. 11 and 12, Paul said, not that I'm implying that I was in any personal want, for I have learned how to be content. Well, I'm kind of glad that Paul said he had to learn it because I'm still learning it and probably will be learning it and relearning it over and over most of my life. And I would expect that Paul had to also. He learned the principles. I think I know the principles of how to be content, but we, we keep having to apply them over and over. And we, we have to do it through determination because there's nothing about our flesh that's ever going to just feel satisfied. The flesh just doesn't know how to be satisfied. So we have to be stronger in spirit than our flesh is so we can do things by decision, not by feeling. He said, I've learned how to be content, satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed. Satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed or disquieted in whatever state I am in. And you know, verse 13 of Philippians 4 is a very, very, very popular verse of Scripture, one that we use, and I think sometimes out of context. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that doesn't mean that you can just go do anything that you decide to do because you decide you want to do it. Paul was talking about a specific area of how he was able, through the power of Christ, to be content no matter what his circumstances were. I do believe that we can do whatever we need to do in life. I think that's a mindset that we need to have. There's nothing that's too much for you if you're trusting God. You can handle whatever comes your way because he promises that he'll never put more on us than what we can bear and deal with. So keep a positive attitude no matter where you're at right now, no matter what's going on in your life. Cheer up. Have a positive attitude. God is on your side. And just stop being upset about things that you can't do anything about. The word discontent means not satisfied, unhappy, a sense of resentment. I think sometimes we resent other people that have it easier than we do. It's easy if you really had a lousy upbringing to resent people who got to live in a leave it to beaver home, you know. 
If you're single, it's easy to resent somebody who is married. If you have no children, it's easy to resent somebody who has some. It's always easy to resent somebody who has what you want. But God doesn't want us to be resentful or envious. He wants us to be satisfied. He wants us to know that He has an individual plan for our lives, and He wants us to individually trust Him that what His plan is for me is not what His plan is for somebody else. And I have to trust that God knows more about what I need and what I can handle than I know. And I want to repeat what I can handle. Because sometimes we want things that we don't have enough character to handle even if we had them. Amen? Why is it that one person can have this awesome singing voice? And maybe somebody else who can't sing nearly as well as they can gets record contracts and deals and you know, they just go to the top of the charts and this other person just never seems to go anywhere. Well, you know, we may never know the answer to all that. But sometimes people have a gift that could take them somewhere, but they don't have enough character to keep them there once they got there. And so we need to let God grow us up and we need to be more concerned about developing godly character than we do about our circumstances, trusting that God will take care of our circumstances when the time is right. I want to repeat, sometimes we want things that if God gave them to us, it would be our undoing. Just because you want it doesn't mean you're ready for it yet. Hello. I said just because you want it doesn't mean you're ready for it yet. I'll just throw out an example. Maybe you've been married twice already and you're wanting to get married again. <laughs> well, maybe you ought to just cool your jets a little bit and spend a couple of years trying to figure out why the first two didn't work. Oh, it was them. It was them. It was, oh yeah, it's always somebody else. You know, always. And you know, maybe it was, but maybe there's some things you need to learn too. You know, maybe God would like you to study how to be a good husband or wife before you ever try to get married. <laughs> now, that went over good, didn't it? <laughs> you know, you can't be satisfied if you're not going to trust God. <laughs> I'm going to say it one more time because I just feel like somebody needs it and isn't getting it yet. <laughs> just because you want it doesn't mean it's right for you. <laughs> Thank you. You finally woke up. Not satisfied, unhappy, a sense of resentment, unsatisfactory, a feeling of displeasure, an attitude of displaying displeasure. Discontent also means complaining, grumbling, murmuring, jealousy, envy, to be depressed, downcast, or have a sad countenance. Let's look at Proverbs 31, 27. It's about a woman, so get ready, ladies. <laughs> she looks well to how things go in her household. And the bread of idleness, gossip, discontent, and self-pity she will not eat. Doesn't say she doesn't feel like it. It says she will not, and I believe it has to be a decision. Well, why is this addressed to women? Obviously, men and women certainly both have the same problems, but as a woman, I do think that it's safe to say that because of the emotional side of our nature, we maybe have to be a little bit more careful because we can really easily get into the feeling of things. And if you pay too much attention to how you feel, you're going to go right down the drain with all these bad, bad, bad attitudes. Men normally, not all the time, but men normally are more logical. Where women have a tendency, and here again, it's not always that way. Women have a tendency to go more with their feelings. And so this lady in Proverbs 31 does not allow those negative emotions to control her. She will not let discontentment 
rule her life. Every woman in here say, I am a contented woman. And all the men say, good. <laughs> now, I, you know, I found a, an absolutely love it scripture. Proverbs 27, 20. What is hell like anyway? <laughs> I'm not going to go there, thankfully, so I'll never get to experience it firsthand. But I think sometimes we can have hell on earth if we're not careful. Amen? Proverbs 27, 20 says, Sheol, the place of the dead, and Abaddon, the place of destruction, are never satisfied. <laughs> So the lust of the eyes of man is never satisfied. So I was thinking about that and I thought, I think one of the things that people who spend eternity in hell, one of the things they're going to experience is they are never, never satisfied. Do you know what a torment that is to never, ever, ever be satisfied? Imagine being doomed to eternal discontentment and dissatisfaction. But as I said, if you're not careful, you can have hell on earth by just never being satisfied with anything here. No matter what God does for you, no matter what you have, never being satisfied. I made a decision in my life that I'm going to learn how to be content and satisfied no matter what I'm doing and no matter what's going on. I think if we have the power of God in us that we should not be ruled by our circumstances. How many of you agree with that? See, real victory and real freedom, real freedom is, is not never having a problem. <laughs> real freedom is being able to not be bothered by your problems. To not let those things disturb or disquiet you, no matter what state you're in. Paul said, I've learned how to be content. Satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed, no matter what state I'm in. In Ecclesiastes, Chapter 6, Solomon observed that life under the sun left a man laboring but never satisfied. Well, life under the sun means that's the way it is in the world. But you know what? If we're in the kingdom, if we're loving God and serving God, then I don't think that it should be that way for us. I think we should be able to, to labor and be satisfied. We should be able to enjoy our homes and enjoy our families and, and enjoy what we have, even if what we have is not as much as somebody else has. I think we should be able to enjoy our work. I don't think you should hate your job and hate going to work. If you hate it that bad, get another one. But don't spend your life murmuring and complaining about somewhere you're going to go every day. Learn how to enjoy what you have. And by all means, learn how to enjoy yourself. Why don't you just stop taking an inventory every morning of everything that's wrong with you? God already knew it before you figured it out. And most everybody else knows it too. So just don't worry about it. Amen? Learn how to get content. Hey, I used to wish I was a nice, sweet little lady with a soft little nice voice. And well, you know, it ain't that way. So here it is. This is what I am. Amen? About six weeks ago, I called a spa to make an appointment for a facial. The lady said, do you have any facial hair? <laughs> well, I wasn't where she was at at all, you know? I mean, I forget sometimes that because my voice is so deep on, on a phone when nobody's looking at me <laughs> that they think I'm a man. And so I had asked for this certain facial that apparently they couldn't do if you had facial hair. So she said, do you have any facial hair? Well, I'm just not there at all. So I'm thinking, well, yeah, I've got some eyebrows and some eyelashes. And, I mean, I was literally just doing like this little facial scan. And then I even thought, well, everybody's got that little... So I said to her, well, yeah, everybody's got some. And she said, no, I mean, do you have a beard or a goatee? <laughs> now, you, 
you know what? I know I'm free because that didn't bother me at all. I laughed about it. I'm not trying to be somebody else now. I'm not trying to get something I don't have, be something I'm not, be like somebody else. Get content with who you are and what you have and take it and make the best out of it. Make peace with your hips and make peace with your thighs. And <laughs> Come on, is anybody awake out there today? Well, I wish that I could just eat all day and be skinny like you. Well, you can't. Maybe you feel like your metabolism's in a coma. I know how you feel. All right, pressing on. Doorways to contentment and satisfaction. Keys, secrets. I like to know how to get in, don't you? So let's see if we can find a few open doors today into this life of contentment and satisfaction that sounds so yummy. First of all, if you're going to be content, you've got to have a humble attitude. And I want to tell you that humility is something you don't come by easy. It is the cardinal virtue. The virtue that should be sought after more than any other is to have an attitude of humility. First of all, a humble person is thankful for what they have because they realize that truthfully they deserve nothing. Did you hear me? I mean, they are grateful to have anything because they realize that if it was not for the grace and the mercy and the kindness and the goodness of God, that they would have absolutely nothing. So every time we are dissatisfied with what we have, it is a display of pride. Because really what we're saying is, I deserve more. A proud person thinks more highly of himself than he ought to, and he assumes that he should have more than what he has. He, of course, should be the boss at work. He, of course, should be the one that got the promotion. Of course, everybody should pay more attention to us because of how wonderful and how important we are. <laughs> and many times God withholds all that stuff that we want because if we got it, it would just feed that nasty spirit of pride. And you're only fit to have that kind of stuff when it means nothing to you. When at the same time people are making on over you, you can be saying to God, I know I'm nothing without you. Amen? Amen. People find it very difficult to be satisfied with any of the people in their life. Because in pride, they feel that those people just don't measure up to what they ought to be. Well, if I were you, I would. And I think you should. And I don't believe you should. And I can't believe you did that. Well, how could you not know that? And why are you not faster? And how can you be so slow? And why does it take you so long to learn? Come on, we're digging in. And you know why? Because we always think in areas that we're strong in, which by the way, we're only strong in those areas because God has gifted us, has nothing to do with me. I'm a good communicator because God has gifted me as a communicator. In case you haven't noticed, I do not have to try to convey my feelings. But I have to watch it that when I'm with somebody who is a lousy communicator, that I'm not like mad half the time because how could you be so vague when you talk and how could you have forgotten to tell me that and why does it take you so long to tell me that? I could have told you that in two seconds and we've been at this 30 minutes already. And God just has to keep at it and keep at it and keep at it and keep at it until he knocks that nonsense out of us. 
because to, in order to be satisfied and content, we can't spend our life comparing everybody else to ourselves and thinking that we're the epitome of what everybody ought to be. Come on, I see you guys. You're not hiding because you're way up there. I see you. Isn't it true? A truly happy person has to be a humble person. You know, in the Beatitudes, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, which means the humble, those who rate themselves as no better than other people. And in the Amplified Bible, the word blessed is defined as satisfied, happy. See, we're really not blessed people if we're going around dissatisfied and discontented all the time. In Matthew 11, it says, the humble find rest for their souls. In Romans 12, it says, only the humble can live in harmony. So this virtue of humility is something that we really need to seek after. Those who rate themselves as no better than other people. And in the Amplified Bible, the word blessed is defined as satisfied, happy. See, we're really not blessed people if we're going around dissatisfied and discontented all the time. In Matthew 11, it says, the humble find rest for their souls. In Romans 12, it says, only the humble can live in harmony. So this virtue of humility is something that we really need to seek after. Now, let's look at a wonderful story in the Bible about a young man that we call the prodigal son in Luke 15. I've learned a lot by really studying this story rather than just reading it. Beginning in verse 11, there was a certain man who had two sons. And the younger said to his father, Father, give me. <laughs> you ought to draw a circle around give me. Because to be honest, that's pretty much where we all start out in our relationship with God. Father, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. We've got our list of 20 things every day that we have to have to be happy and stay saved. <laughs> Now, God, I just can't take any more of this. <laughs> if you don't do something with my husband and if you don't do something with my kids. We never want him to do anything with us. <laughs> How many times do you go to God and say, you know, God, if you just don't change me. <laughs> so he says, Father, give me my inheritance. He wanted more. He wasn't satisfied with what he had. He wasn't satisfied to be under his father's authority living in a house of blessing. He wanted it all so he could go and do what he wanted to do. So his dad gave it to him. And I think that's interesting because sometimes the only way God can get us to realize that what we think we want is not what we want is to go ahead and give it to us and let us see how unhappy it makes us. And so you know the story. He went out, wasted all of his money, ended up working for a pig farmer, ended up eating what the pigs eat. And then it says he came to himself. He came to his right mind. And he said, I know what I'll do. I'll go back to my father. And I will say, Father, make me, not give me. <laughs> he had a total change. It's amazing what a couple of trips to the pig pen will do for you. <laughs> Hello. It's amazing how we can start out thinking we deserve it all. And then when we finally meet ourselves, and get to know ourselves and to see what a stinking, haughty, prideful attitude we have. <laughs> then we can come back, oh God, <laughs> who am I to ever judge anybody else? <laughs> who am I, God, to think that I have nothing to learn? Who am I to feel like that I should always be the one that has more? The truth is, God, I deserve nothing and everything you give me, I am so thankful and so grateful. Help me, God, to learn to be content where I'm at in my life and to appreciate what you've done for me. Come on, let's give him bigger praise than that.
You know, humility comes through brokenness. And brokenness doesn't come easy. It usually takes a few trips like this young man experienced to get us from give me, give me, give me, give me to make me what you want me to be. Give me only what you want me to have. And God, if I ask you for something that's not right, please don't give it to me. Because I know the nature of the flesh, and I know I can get greedy, and I know I can be haughty and have a bad attitude. So please, God, continue to work this humility in me. That is the key virtue that we see in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The second key that I believe will really bring us into a place of contentment is real fellowship with God, not religious activity. Real fellowship with God. In John 16, the Bible says that God sent the Holy Spirit to be in close fellowship with us. Jesus didn't die so we could all have a religion. He died so we could have a deep, intimate, personal relationship with God through Him. So we could have an ongoing conversation with God in our hearts all day long. So we could know right from wrong and have discernment when we're getting ready to make a mistake. You can have fellowship with God. You can talk to Him about everything, and He cares about everything that concerns you. His eye is on you all the time. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, I want to show you what I think is one of the most beautiful scriptures in the Bible. Psalm 17, 15. When I was going through my years of being so dissatisfied, when I came across this, I just thought this is wonderful. Psalm chapter 17, verse 15. As for me, this was David. As for me, he's establishing what he's going to do. I will continue beholding your face in righteousness, rightness, justice, and right standing with you. Now watch this. I shall be fully satisfied when I awake to find myself beholding your form and having sweet communion with you. Wow. When your need for God is so great. When you've come to the point where you understand how deeply you need Him and how you cannot do without Him. You don't jump out of bed in the morning and start on your own plan and then wait until nighttime to say anything to God. You start talking to Him and fellowshipping with Him when you first open your eyes in the morning before you ever got the sleepies out of your eyes. Because you know you're a desperate person. You know you're nothing without Him and you know you cannot make it without Him. We need to have the attitude, God, if you're not going, don't send me. Because I'm nothing without you. I love what David said in Psalm 27, 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord. Not my list of 20 things I need to keep me happy, but one thing I ask of the Lord. And that will I seek after. That I might behold your beauty and live in your presence all the days of my life. Whatever it is you think you need that's got you all discontented and dissatisfied, it is not what you need. <laughs> it may be what you want, but what you need is a deeper relationship with God. It's to know Him and the power of His resurrection. It's not religious activity. It's not going through the motions. It's not trying to, you know, read a certain amount of Scripture every day because you think you get brownie points with God because of that. It's not trying to pray one hour boring prayers when you can hardly wait for it to be over because you're trying to put in your time with God. Throw that clock away when you pray. Don't pray by the clock and then be proud of yourself because you put in a certain amount of time. Live with Him. Live in Him. Live through Him. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. I shall be fully satisfied when I wake up in the morning. And before I'm fully awake, I'm already communicating with God. That only comes to people who know how deep their need is. David said, unto you, O Lord, do I bring my life. I love that. Let's look at Psalm 63, first few verses. Psalm 63, 1. A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Oh God, you are my God, earnestly will I seek you. 
My inner self thirsts for you. What are you thirsty for? What are you hungry for? My flesh longs and is faint for you in a dry and a weary land where there is no water. Don't go out of your house every day thinking, well, if I can just get that promotion at work or if I can just make more money or if I could just get a new outfit or if I could just get a date with that good looking guy or if I could just, you know, come on. That's not going to make you happy. Apart from him, there is no joy. Apart from him, there is no real happiness. Now look at verse 5, 63. Verse 5. My whole being shall be satisfied. Woo! As with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches. When are you going to be satisfied? When God is first in your life. You better examine your heart daily to ask God if he really is first or if it's just some religious thing you say. Don't sing, I surrender all, if you don't mean it. Come on, I'm talking to some people today. Amen. Keys to satisfaction. Realize that discontentment is an insult to God. <laughs> that it does no good at all, and it only makes you unhappy. Be satisfied with the gifts that you have. If you'd like to be a singer and you're not, oh well, be satisfied. <laughs> if you'd love to be the one up here doing the preaching, but you've got the ministry of helps, oh well, be satisfied. If you'd like to have a great big house like some of those you drive by and look at, but you're still living in an apartment, be satisfied. Whatever your gift is, be satisfied. My husband is one of the happiest people that I have ever known in my whole life and one of the most content and satisfied. I am telling you the truth, in 42 years, I could probably count on two hands the number of times I've heard him complain except when he's in traffic. <laughs> now that we can't count. Because like all men, he thinks that every other driver is a dunce. <laughs> Cannot understand why they're so slow. Why did you pull out in front of me? I'm like, excuse me, you did that yesterday. Somebody, oh no, I didn't. <laughs> but anyway, other than the traffic thing, he is the happiest person that I know. And you know why? Because he's so content with who he is. And people ask us all the time, you know, is it a problem for Dave that you're the one up in front of the people and he's not? Not a problem for him. God showed him a long time ago. If you just do what I've asked you to do, then you're going to have joy and peace in your life. And isn't that really what we want after all? See, we think that we're going to get to that joy and peace and satisfaction through doing something. But it's not through doing something or through having something. It's through being satisfied with what you're doing and what you have. Come on. It's not in getting something else. His happiness is not in being up here doing what I'm doing. We tried that. A minister who felt like that women shouldn't do what I'm doing gave us a word. <laughs> Brother, you should be the one teaching that Bible study in your home, not your wife. Well, Dave and I went home and tried. I tried to shut up and he tried to do the teaching. We did that for about three weeks, and the people coming to the Bible study said, why are you guys doing this? <laughs> you could see them starting to dwindle. <laughs> Just because somebody tells you ought to be doing something, that doesn't mean you ought to be doing it. Every pastor's wife doesn't have to play the piano and sing. Every pastor's wife doesn't have to teach the ladies' Bible study. Every pastor's wife doesn't have to work at the church. Come on. Why don't we set people free to be who they are? I want to show you a wonderful scripture in John chapter 3. I might get attached to this chair. You never know. Oh, I better get up though. I'm not burning as many calories. 
All right, you ready for this? I love this. John 3, verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the land, the countryside of Judea, where he remained with them and baptized. But John was also baptizing at Aenon near Salim, for there was an abundance of water there, and the people kept coming and being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Verse 25, now there arose a controversy between John's disciples and a Jew regarding purification. So they came to John and reported to him. <laughs> I love this. The devil's right there always trying to stir something up. Rabbi, the man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, at the Jordan crossing, and to whom you yourself have borne testimony, notice now here he is baptizing and now everybody's running to him. Trying to put jealousy between John and Jesus over who was going to baptize the most people. Now you think, well, how dumb. Well, you know what? A lot of different denominations fighting with each other over some of the stuff they fight about is equally as dumb. I just don't understand it. Whole people splitting off into new denominations over whose name you ought to baptize in. If you're concerned, just do it at all. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Jesus' name, Father's name, Holy Ghost's name. We don't need to be fighting over silly stuff like that. I mean, that's ridiculous. We need unity and harmony and agreement. We need to find places where we can agree, not places where we disagree. People fighting over speaking in tongues. Well, if you want to, do, and if you don't, don't. But quit fighting about it. I do, but I can love you if you don't. <gasps> well, now I don't know if I can listen to you. Why, you silly thing, you. What has that got to do with anything? Amen? Well, I don't know if I believe in that. Well, maybe you're wrong. <laughs> now that you're working on humility, maybe you're wrong. <laughs> Ooh, that's an idea. We don't need to be fighting over the stuff that we fight about. Well, should we baptize babies? Should we baptize adults? You know, if you're that concerned about it, just do it both times. I, you know, I just don't think that we need to, and I'm not trying to be silly. I mean, I think that those things are important. I think the doctrines of our faith are important. But, you know, I don't suppose that God would get upset if we got baptized twice, if there was a real concern. I mean, I'm just, let's just do what we need to do and get on with serving God and quit fighting over stuff that don't make any sense. <laughs> Who's right anyway? None of us. Not 100%. That's why we've got to be open to growing and learning. And this is the standard. Not what I think or what you think or what my denomination says, but this is the standard of what we base our faith on is the Word of God and what He says. Amen? Well, I don't know if I believe the devil's real. No wonder you're a mess. I said something the other day to a lady that's been a Christian for, I mean, a long time. And, uh, you know, she's, she's not like a wild Christian like I am, but she's a Christian. <laughs> Loves God, goes to church. And I said something to her about, well, yeah, that was just the devil. And she looked at me like, I could tell that was just totally out of her realm of understanding. You know what? We need, we need to stop being afraid to know the truth. You need to know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Amen? The devil is alive and well on planet Earth, and the good news is that you've got authority over him in Jesus Christ. So here the devil was trying to stir up contention between John and Jesus. <laughs> Nothing new going on today, amen? Well, look, now he's baptizing more people than you are. What are we going to do? Now we're losing our crowd. Everybody's running to him. Well, pastor, there's a new church that opened up two blocks from here, and some of our people are going there. When we opened an outreach to the poor and the needy in the inner city, 
We had local churches getting upset because we didn't need to come in there as a big ministry and steal their people. So I can't help the poor because my ministry is bigger than yours? And you're afraid that I'm going to take your people? If you're taking care of your people, they ain't going to go somewhere else. If your sheep wander, don't accuse somebody else of stealing them. Best thing you could do instead of getting mad at the new church coming in is go buy them a sound system, tell them you're glad they're there, and say, maybe we can do some outreaches together. Amen? We need to get over our silliness. Here was what John answered back. A man can receive nothing in verse 27. A man can receive nothing, he can claim nothing, he can take unto himself nothing, except as it has been granted to him from heaven. A man must be content to receive the gift which is given him from heaven. There is no other source. And then John goes on to say, you know, I'm just a forerunner. He must increase and now I must decrease. I've been doing this. But now my time for that is up. God's sending somebody greater than I am. I've paved the way, but now I'm going to fade away into the background. Let me tell you something. We all have our day, but if we don't know how to get out of the way when our day is over. Hello. We're not very good at turning the torch over to the next generation. We need to learn how to raise other people up. And in the process of that, we're actually lifting ourselves up. Be content with the gift that you have. I so much wanted to play guitar and sing. I thought if I could play guitar, sing, and preach, woo what a ministry I could have. But the problem is nobody ever could figure out what key I sang in. And I'm not exaggerating, that is the truth. And when I sang, they would turn the microphone off. Because I sing in a different key than everybody else does. And my fingers were too short to learn how to play the guitar. And not only that, I failed music in school, so. Oh, well, I guess I'll just have to talk. Guess I'll just have to be content with my gift. Come on. I'm preaching better than you're acting. Can somebody today just get happy with yourself? Come on, take a look at yourself and say, this is it. This is what I got to work with. <laughs> I'm going to do the best I can with it. All right. Now, right thinking and right speaking is very important to your level of satisfaction and contentment. Proverbs 14, 14, a good man is satisfied with right and holy thoughts. You can get yourself so messed up just with your own thinking. Learn to believe the best about people. If you have right thoughts, you're going to be a more satisfied person. Don't spend your time thinking about what you can get. Spend your time thinking about what you can give. I challenge you every day in the morning to spend at least five or ten minutes aggressively thinking about something you can do that day to be a blessing to somebody else. I mean, do it on purpose. Sit down and say, now God, I want you to show me what I can do for somebody else today because I refuse to live this day as a selfish, self-centered, discontented, dissatisfied Christian. I am not going to live like that. We got to be like that lady in Proverbs 31. She refused to eat idleness and discontent and self-pity and gossip. She refused to live like that. Refuse to be like that. And then the Bible also says in Proverbs 18, let's put this up because I think this is really good. Proverbs 18, verse 20 and 21. A man's moral self shall be filled with the fruit of his mouth. And look at this. And with the consequences of his words, he must be satisfied, whether good or evil. Do you know 